Oops. Yeah, so some five years ago, there was a, a posting put up by Tim VK2XAX on VKVHF, and uh, this is an excerpt from it, uh, telling us that there'd be a two gig trans transmission from uh, Jet Propulsion Labs, JPL, in California. Uh, conducting essentially an EME test. They called it a moon ranging test. I'm not sure what they were really trying to achieve. And uh, it seemed like an invitation for hams with the capability of receiving to have a go and see if they could receive the signal. And in, I've highlighted some of the text there. Uh, their original plan was for 2041 megahertz, 2.041 gig, uh, transmitting uh, 20 kilowatts from a 34 meter diameter dish. I didn't know you could make that much power on, <laughs> <laughs> on two pretty, gigs, but pretty, anyway. Pretty uh, big clustron. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so I thought, well, gee, we ought to be able to hear that. Um, and, and so the project from our end was born. Started to think about how we were going to do it. <laughs> The Tim's posting was actually uh, sort of forwarded on, I suppose, uh, from uh, a chap by the name of Jim Lux, W6RMK, who was conducting or doing some of the work anyway at JPL. So, yeah, that set us thinking. And, and they were aiming at, at that uh, crater on the moon crater called Tycho on the moon. You go go at any time on a full moon, you ought to see it quite well. You, you would have seen it. Um, now, note they weren't aiming at the moon. They were aiming at a crater. A 34 metre diameter dish, assuming that they were illuminating the entire surface, and I think they probably were for because of what they were trying to achieve, what I think they were trying to achieve, uh, that dish would have had a beam width of about 0.1 degree. Uh, the moon is about 0.5 degrees across when you look at it. So they were illuminating a pretty small part of the of the moon, and that's of significance. That's another close-up shot of it. Anyway, JPL. Um, they're uh, a division. I'm not sure that they're really a division of NASA, but they uh, uh, they're certainly funded by NASA and managed by Caltech. Uh, they're headquartered in Pasadena, and they were established in as far as I've been able to ascertain. They were established in the 1930s, and initially it was actually a bunch of amateur rocketeers uh, who um, got together and. That was the nucleus of rocket expertise in the USA, and uh, the military decided that this might be worth funding, could be fun and useful. And eventually it, it grew into being JPL. And as the space race continued, they got more and more money and developed better and better toys. And ultimately, uh, they became responsible for a, a lot of the space comms uh, that, that NASA needed, and including the, and most importantly, I think, is the deep space research programs. Um, they launched the interplanetary probes and, yeah. uh, you know, like yeah. I still remember the launch of um, yeah. the Voyager spacecraft, which is still out there now. Uh, so far, I commented before when we started uh, it. That, uh, new crystal one job done as quickly as possible. Well, sorry. Um, yeah, as I was saying, the the, the voyages uh, so far it takes nearly twenty one hours now for signals to get from there to Earth. So anyway, they 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 do have some really nice uh, field day gear, shall we say? And it's all centered around the worldwide uh, deep space network and principal locations in 
USA, Spain and Australia. And, you know, you've all seen the pictures. That's the 70 metre dish at right. Oldstone. They call them, each dish has a, a DSS number. So that's the 70 metre dish, not the 34. Yeah. At, at Goldstone. Uh, that's DSS 63 in Madrid and 43 in Canberra. Yeah, well, that's, that's um, what I would have thought. Yeah. Loss of profit would be great. Yeah. So nice big dishes. If you if you look at it, the uh, arrangement of those dishes around the world, you'll see that they, they're spaced at 120 degrees. If you're looking down on the North Pole, they're, they're spaced at 120 degrees around the Earth. And uh, they've got 24-hour coverage around um, the sky. But that's not what they were using. They were using this one, the 34-metre dish. They call it the 34-metre beam waveguide antenna, DSS-24, which is at their Mojave Desert facility. And it, it's a... I, I looked into it, and it's a really, really fascinating thing in its own right. Uh, they call it a beam waveguide antenna, and there's a diagram of it, a cross-section through it. Wow. The, the transmitter room is down in the bottom here, what, what they call the uh, microwave packages, the transmitters, or I suppose they could put receivers there if they needed to. But, but they, were, they had a transmitter here. The red shaded area shows the path of the beam on its way up to the dish. So there's a little ref, a, a sub-reflector down the bottom that it's... Where did my pointer go? There. So there's a beam into the reflector there. It continues up to a reflector at that point, across, up, across again, through the hole in the middle to the sub-reflector at the top, which is a con convex ref uh, reflector and illuminates the entire beam. So count the paths. There are seven reflecting paths on the way up there. And that part is, that's effectively a waveguide all the way along there. And it's arranged that way because if you look at that, this, this plane along here, it allows the dish to rotate in on the vertical axis through 360 degrees continuously without breaking the beam. And if you look at it at this point, it allows the the, uh, the dish to tilt from horizon to horizon without breaking the, the beam. So they can position that anywhere in the sky, continually tracking anything that they want to and uh, keep the beam on it. So it's a very clever arrangement. Uh, who knows what it would be like? I couldn't imagine anyone would want to be in the room down there when, when they've got a 20 kilowatt to be transmitter running. That's a big microwave oven, isn't it? Um, and I, I queried this. Did they, did, did they really mean 20 kilowatts of power? And the answer is yes, it was 20 kilowatts of transmitted power, not 20 kilowatts ERP. So that's, that's the arrangement. It's quite a fascinating device. Okay. Well, what's going to follow for a little while here is just a little bit of correspondence that uh, happened amongst us who were interested in in um, seeing or hearing the signal in the planning stages. And I, I don't want you to get a, the idea that this was straightforward, you know, a couple of emails back and forth, yes, out we go and uh, have a look for the signal. It was pretty convoluted and the story kept changing or the plans kept changing and we only had a short period of time. This was around uh, late February, um, mid to late February and the transmission was planned for the 3rd of March. So I only had a very short time to get things together and Brian uh, replied to one of my comments and um, you can read it there. In particular, that he suggested it would be nice, you know, to 
have an LNA feeding a stabilized spectrum analyzer. And that was, oops, that was exactly what we ended up doing because we didn't have any receiving equipment for two, two gigahertz. We've got transverters, plenty of them for 2.4 gigs, but they wouldn't, it was just not practical to make them work on two gigs. So whilst I have access to a spectrum analyzer uh, from my employer, it's an old uh, HP 8566 that weighs about 60 kilos. Um, and it's a bit delicate, not the kind of thing that you want to go bouncing around the countryside. But I knew someone who had a really nice modern one, portable one, which was just as capable, certainly for this purpose. And I thought, well, that's how I think we'll go. And the the advantage of the spectrum analyzer, of course, is that not only can we detect the signal, but we can actually measure signal levels. And that, that was excellent. And there was another advantage in that we could invoke uh, frequency tracking, signal tracking with it so that uh, with the Doppler shift that uh, would have occurred, the spectrum, so long as the signal was adequate, the spectrum analyzer would have locked onto it and just kept tracking it. Okay, so I corresponded with Jim uh, in Goldstone and he gave me a bit more detail, gave me the precise frequency. 2041.000, which then ended up being changed, as you'll see. And the test was going to be in two parts. In the first part, they were going to send a CW carrier on a constant frequency, modulated with ranging tones, as they call them. I don't. I try to look into it, and it gets a bit mathematical for me. But that's what they were going to do. And in the second part of the test, they were going to Doppler compensate just a pure carrier unmodulated carrier. Hold that thought. They're going to Doppler compensate. The reason being that they were conducting a test on the moon, which was on its way to be setting. It wasn't quite a setting moon, but eventually would have been setting. So if you just think about being on the surface of the Earth, this is for those who are, are not familiar with this kind of thing. When you're looking at the moon setting, it's actually moving away from you quite fast and so that would have caused a Doppler shift and that's what they were compensating for so they would have seen the frequency dropping so they would have had to send a, a signal that was increasing in frequency okay so anyway at least I had at this point I had a frequency to work with uh, and I replied that well you know, this, and these are just excerpts from emails uh, I'd let him know we'd be using a four-foot diameter dish. I thought I'd better talk American to them. Uh, so I called it a four-foot dish. Notice that. I also said that we'd use a receiver noise figure under 1 dB. That turned out to be optimistic and also not particularly important. And Jim replied, as you can see, that we should see a huge signal. They're just using a, they were just using a 15 dB horn antenna and a 3 to 4 dB noise figure. As it turns out, I think our noise figure would have been something like that as well. So it's very similar receiver sensitivity, if you like. But our antenna had 10 dB more gain. We had 25 dB with a 1.2 meter dish. And there we are. That's a photo taken in the field, uh, just on the Elko Road uh, near Lara overlooking Port Phillip Bay, I suppose. You can see the 1.2 metre dish there. The uh, chaps in the picture is Ken, 3NW, in the foreground there. Dave, 3QM, behind the uh, grid pack antenna. And Bert kneeling on the ground with his head under a jacket to shade the setting sun, which was behind us, as you can see there. So he could at least see the screen on the spectrum analyzer. You know, we, we had to, we only had maybe yeah. half an hour to set up. It, it was just not, with the time available after work to shoot up the hill <clears throat> and set our gear up, it, it, we, we were really up against it. Anyway, we did get set up, you can see there. 
A um, couple of points. The the grid pack antenna, uh, Ken brought that along uh, rather optimistically. Not not that we couldn't have seen the signal. I'm sure we would have seen it on that, but uh, we just would we didn't end up having time to try it. The 1.2 meter dish is what we were using. You can see the feed on it. It's a cavity back dipole of uh, design by Andy VK2. ES now he was a -E VK3 ES now he was VK2 AES home brew arrangement uh, intended for 2.4 gigs but plenty of bandwidth in that for the job we wanted no problem the problem that, that we did have though is just the two all the noise on two gigs just shocking from everything including probably that little building there with the antennas above it we managed that in, in a couple of ways. Uh, as you'll see, I put a filter in front of the receiver. We brought a filter of, along. I'll show you a picture of that in a minute. And the other thing was I, I just hit on the idea. I thought, I wonder if I rotate the plane of polarization of the, of the dipole of the feed, could I find the null? And indeed, I did. It was good. The transmission of, uh, from JPL was circular polarization, so it wouldn't matter what polarization I used um, and I was able to get a reasonable null in the noise not eliminated completely but uh, certainly reduce it and it was just a spur of the moment thing or thought that came to me and that that's me kneeling down in front of the spec and now uh, genuflecting perhaps in front of a spectrum analyzer as one should uh, you can see the you can just see the moon up there, um, it wasn't quite as big as what Hayden made it look. Uh, what else was going to say? Yeah, that's it. There's the receiver, or should I say the front end of the receiver. I told you we had to cobble something up in a hurry. So it's really just the front end. It's a gain block with some filters that we... Uh, uh, built up out of existing bits that we had on hand one night in, in my garage here David and I uh, put it together, tested it and it seemed to work alright so yep we'll go with that and I'll explain the parts of it in a minute um, another picture of it there and you can see actually if I go back to the previous shot you can see there's a bit of coax with it's doing nothing there. It's just sort of hanging over the, uh, the the business here. Originally, we had the the feed point with that bit of coax. We had had the feed point connected directly to the LNA, which is this part here, the very low noise gas mimic preamp. And uh, I think that there was just so much signal power around two gigahertz even out of band, out of away from where we were looking at, that was probably overloading one or more stages of the front end. So we in, inserted this uh, filter block here, uh, which helped quite a lot, actually. It tamed down the, uh, the noise. So I think it, there must have been some overload. The downside of it was that it added probably 3 dB to the noise figure, maybe a little bit more. But as it turns out, it doesn't matter because we were externally noise limited with this setup. So that's a picture there. And that's a, a better picture that I took uh, a few days ago, just labeled. So there's the very low noise gas mimic amplifier feeding another mimic amplifier, one of the mini kits things, just stuff that you have on hand when you experiment with microwaves, uh, into homebrew cavity pipe cap style filter and around into another mimic amplifier and then out to the spectrum analyzer. So that was the front end and that's all we really needed because the rest of it was all built into the spectrum analyzer. The, the idea was to 
have sufficient gain and a low enough noise figure to be able to drive the uh, spectrum analyzer. And there's the result. That's a, a screen uh, shot that uh, Bert saved of the signal. So I'll probably dwell on this a little bit. And uh, those of you who, are, who look at that and fully understand it, or forgive me if it, if it sounds like I'm teaching you to suck eggs, but there, there are, I'm, I'm well, well aware that there'll be those watching who uh, have probably never seen a spectrum analyzer. Signal level is 100 dBm, well, minus 100 dBm uh, right there. That's a signal peak. That really doesn't matter too much because you know you, you could make it bigger just by more amplification. So in that sense, without no, uh, knowing the gain of the uh, preceding stages and the gain of the antenna and the amount of signal coming back off the moon, it would not mean much. You can certainly calculate all that through and we did at one point, but it doesn't matter. The point is you can see that the signal sticks out above the noise Twenty dB. Sorry. Twenty dB off the uh, over the noise. Yeah. Yeah, it's twenty dB above the 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 uh, noise floor that we had. And remember, I said that that's really externally uh, uh, determined. Um, and interestingly, another thing, of course, was as as the moon kept rising above the horizon, we had to follow the the moon, uh, and with more elevation, that noise floor actually dropped. This was taken, I think, if, if you look up the top, it's zero, it's 0752 UTC, 652 PM, it says on the clock in, in the spectrum analyzer. And I checked with uh, Bert before and he said, well, he, he wasn't sure, quite sure about the accuracy of it, but it was certainly not far off it. But the actual time is of some significance. Uh, because it's right on the time, right close to the time when the transmission switched from being um, a fixed frequency to a Doppler compensated signal. So I, it was, it's 0755, it changed over. So I couldn't tell you which one it was here. I'm thinking it was probably the... Uh, still the, the modulated signal. Of course, you won't see the ranging tones because they were megahertz apart. And the reason I think of that, I think it was that is because of the, the frequency I was seeing. And I'll, I'll, there'll be more of that later. Okay, so a couple of other things. Uh, the resolution bandwidth on the, on the left there. Think of that as the keyhole through which we're looking at the spectrum. It's the same as the IF bandwidth on your radio. You can narrow that down and it reduces the noise. If you're a CW operator, you would be using uh, a narrower IF uh, bandwidth than for voice. The importance of that is that reducing the IF bandwidth reduces the noise and the signal level is unaffected. So it makes the signal stick out uh, above the noise a whole lot more. And if I can use that analogy, it's like looking for a needle in a hay haystack. Uh, it'd be really nice if you can reduce the size of the haystack and re reducing the bandwidth of the uh, IF does exactly that. The smaller the haystack, the easier it is to find that signal or the needle. Um, so that's about all I really need to say there. So as... Um, Gerhard observed the signal is uh, 20 dB above our local noise. The, the horizontal lines are 5 dB apart. So pretty obvious there, about 20 dB signal to noise ratio, which is a lot. It's 100 times stronger than the noise. Okay. So a, a legitimate question to ask would be, well, how do you know that you really did get the signal? Well, some dot points there peaked on the moon and it tracked across the sky with the moon. And it was smack on the frequency we expected. 
uh, a change from fi fixed frequency to whoops, what happened there? To Doppler compensation at the scheduled time, and we saw that happen. We didn't capture it, but we saw it happen. And then it went off air at precisely the scheduled time. So, you know, there's no question that we really did get the right signal. I just wish it had been there for, for longer because we could have done a bit more tweaking. Never mind, we, we got it. So I replied to Jim in California and I told him, you know, we saw the signal clearly off the moon. You can read that. I won't um, labor that point. Uh, but this, I guess I, I, this highlighted bit here, the signal was so strong that we could easily, we just locked onto it with the spectrum analyzer and as it shifted around the band with Doppler shift and uh, everything else, uh, it was, we were able to track it or the spectrum analyzer tracked it and was always in the middle of the screen. I also commented that I, I was, was puzzled by the signal level. I, I expected it to be higher. I'm not quite sure why now I was trying to think back because when I um, was putting to this presentation together, it, it all made sense. I think the signal that we saw was what we should have got. Uh, but I just remembered I wanted to point something out. I'll just go back to, this, to the picture of the signal. When you look at that, you think, oh, marvelous. What a what a stable, beautiful signal they were getting. It's not like that at all. Had you been there, you would have seen the signal jittering from side to side all over the place, uh, falling in and out of the uh, IF bandwidth and jumping up and down in signal power as well in, in um, level. That's due to the motion of the moon. Remember, they were lighting up a very small part of the moon with a, a signal at around uh, at two gigahertz, uh, which is a, a wavelength of 15 centimeters. So there's, there's ridges and rocks and craters and all sorts of stuff on the moon that that signal was bouncing off. Now, if the moon was not, was perfectly still, that wouldn't matter. But the moon actually rocks a little bit in its orbit, east to west. It's, it's a very slow motion, but the point is though that the surface is moving uh, across the signal path. It's called libration. And it ends up scattering the signal and, and putting this random Doppler motion over the top of the motion uh, of the moon itself. So you end up with a signal that's jittering all over the place. And it was just fortuitous that Bert managed to capture a few, well, this particular shot is the best one that shows the, uh, the signal um, at its best, shall we say. But it was not like that at all. It was uh, quite dynamic to see it. So anyway, I'll keep going on. So there we are. I've told Jim what we saw and, I'm, and particularly that down the bottom how I thought that we should have got a higher signal level. And this is his reply. More signal than we saw. <laughs> uh, they had only 10 to 15 dB above the noise in a one hertz bandwidth. That is really important because you look at our signal and we're 20 dB above the noise floor. He's 15 dB above his noise floor. But our noise floor was set with a 100 hertz bandwidth in other words, it was 20 dB higher than that. So we were actually 40. If, if we had been measuring in a one hertz bandwidth, we would have been 40 dB above the noise floor. And he, he uh, acknowledges that uh, down here, I, that I'd expect that much, 40 to 45 dB above the noise floor. He thought that he would have been 35 dB above the noise floor. Uh, but then he says our receiver is not very hot. I, I think his if he really had a four to five dB noise figure, 
uh, then it would have been comparable to what we were using. So I don't think that that was the reason. Uh, there's probably more to it than that. And he goes on to say that our measurement was quite useful. And the reason is, from their point of view, they were about 20 dB below what they expected to see as a return signal. So put yourself in their shoes. Was it their receiver? or something wrong with the transmitter, where was the problem? Turns out that having an independent measurement uh, that confirms the signal level to be what they expect uh, enable them to say, well, it can't be the transmitter, the problem's in our receiver, okay? So it turned out to be useful for them, and I'm you know, quite chuffed about that. Um, they were using a horn antenna and just go back, yes, I should have drawn attention to this. The aperture of their antenna was 0.1 square metre. So 0.1 square metre at a, a two gig horn antenna, that's the size of it. About 370 mil by about 270 odd mil rectangular horn into a waveguide. That would give about 15 dB gain. So it's, a, it's something you can pick up in one hand and just wave about. Now, th to me, that, that strikes me as rather surprising because they've got this 34-metre dish running 20 kilowatts into it. Um, I would have thought that maybe a bit, a bit better receiver might have been uh, worthwhile. Uh, but obviously, you know, they had an expectation that they would see a bigger signal than they got. So, you know, perhaps their initial calculations would have uh, indicated that this would have been perfectly adequate for their, for their purposes. As it turned out, it wasn't. Uh, in comparison, uh, they, they, they had 0.1 uh, square metre of aperture. That's the opening. We had 1.13 square metres, so 11 times the uh, size and I replied to him, well, you know, thanks for your kind words and all that. And I thought, oh, I'll, I'll sp spring it on him for a QSL card. But <laughs> although he said, uh, you bet we will, I never did receive a QSL card. <laughs> and five years down the track, I suppose, it's probably uh, too late to follow it up. Perhaps I should have sent him a QSL card. Anyway, doesn't matter. Now, Jim wrote to an email to his, I think must have been a superior within JPL. I don't know, uh, Charles Nordet. And they must have been discussing the results we obtained and compared them to, to their own results. And he, he's, he says to, to Charles, we need a better spectrum analyzer next time. <laughs> Uh, we were using he, that is us, uh, we were using a newer Enritsu. And he points, he notes that we were using 100 hertz resolution bandwidth, which would much better have covered the Doppler spread as a signal. Remember I mentioned the signal jittering around. We had 100 times more bandwidth up our sleeve for the signal to jitter inside of, um, whereas they were struggling. So... I think he might have been angling for a new toy. I don't, I don't know. Maybe that was the intention of the project, you know. Mm. <laughs> um, anyway, so then I got an email from Charles uh, who uh, was happy about all that. And uh, he pointed out that after about 8.30ish, they couldn't see the signal at all at JPL, which is not surprising. If they were struggling to – well, look, they weren't struggling, but if they weren't getting as much signal as they thought when the moon was high up on the horizon, by that time, 8.30ish, the moon would have been close to setting, I would think, over there. So they would have been beaming down to the ground. And even where they were, I would have thought that 
there's probably going to be noise coming at the horizon. And then he he asked at the bottom there, he, he asked for my permission to uh, produce our pictures and our measurements you know, in the monthly managerial uh, report. So they were really happy with that. There's a bit of an error here. Uh, he calls it the DSS-14 radiation curve. It's, it was actually DSS-24. DSS-14 was the one I showed you before, the 70 metre dish, whereas this one uh, was D the, the 34 metre. Now, the radiation curve, let's, let's go to that. I'll explain this. This is a, a time plot of their transmission and can you guys see the time stamp across the bottom there? It's lost in my uh, in the clutter at the bottom of my screen. Is that visible? No, I can't see. Jeff. Can't see. Um, well, I, I could momentarily. Oh, it doesn't matter. That's. Uh, 0600 UTC on the left, and it'll be 0900 UTC at, at this point here, this, where the signal goes. No, 0900 is there on this blue line. OK. OK, so let, just let me explain this. The blue trace is the power output of, the, of their transmitter. And you can see it sort of hovers around 20 kilowatts. It came on at this point here in time at the appointed time, which was before we had the moon and before we were even set up. Um, and it continued on until 0900 precisely, and here it is dropping off. Quite why the signal fizzes around like that, goes as high as 20.4 kilowatts. Maybe it's the mains voltage there varying. I, I don't know. I, I have no idea why the signal power was varying. It could be that they were measuring the power up top, in which case there would have been some changes in the beam, a little, you know, small changes in the beam uh, as the as the waveguide part of the exactly. assembly was changing. Yeah. Yeah. It depends on where in the system they were measuring it. I don't know, but anyway. I reckon it could, it could be in that uh, little um, uh, interface uh, with the dish and where there's... Uh, yeah, yeah, at, at, at some point in the beam where... I, I don't know, but yeah, you, you're, both, you're quite right. You're both saying the same thing, effectively. Okay, let's look at the uh, the red trace. The red trace we see on... It's from the right-hand side. It's the signal frequency. So you can see, as they said, in the first part of, transmit, of the transmission... Uh, it's right on 2115 uh, gigahertz, smack on, just stays there. And then this is the point of transition where they switch to Doppler compensation. So the signal frequency dropped to what you see there. And uh, then wh why won't the pointer stay? Oh, hang on. I've might be better with the mouse than the pad. There it is. So it drops to this frequency here and then slowly drops. This is their Doppler compensation until this point here. Then it goes back to CW and eventually this is where the transmitter drops off. Okay, so you can see the two traces, transmit power and what they call the ramp frequency. Okay, hold that thought. So I looked at it and I thought, something wrong here. Because I noted that the, uh, the ramp was downward in frequency for Doppler compensation. And I said, well, with the moon receding from them, wouldn't you need an, to have an increase in carrier frequency to Doppler compensate? Uh, or maybe I've got the wrong end of the stick, you know, I thought I'd better not sound too cocky. Uh, 
<laughs> because I'm, um, you know, it's just, uh, just a backyard ham talking to JPL here. So anyway, he, uh, he replies and he said, no, you don't have the wrong end of the stick. Very observant. Um, turns out that there was a an error or maybe the wrong program file, as he calls it. And their operating engineer picked it up as well. But for their for their purpose, it didn't make any difference, apparently. And then he asked, well, if you're interested in supporting test number two, we would love it. And I don't know if test number two ever came about. But test number two was going to, I think I've got something here. Uh, this is just my thanks to those involved, the people on site there and um, some of the, the local the two local chaps, Tim and Brian, who's with us tonight. But uh, there was some final correspondence that came after that about test number two. I queried, I might make that a bit bigger. I, I asked him a bit more about test number two. I actually, I asked them what were they really trying to achieve? And um, the answer I received was that they're trying to image geostationary satellites. And by that, I'm, I take it to mean they're actually trying to use radar to get a, to get a picture. Basically, yeah, radar picture of geostationary satellites, which aren't exactly huge things. And they're 30 something thousand kilometers out in space. So this was a, an initial trial run uh, on two gigahertz using the moon or a, some features of the moon. And uh, they, they thought no point in trying to look at low earth orbiting satellites because the uh, Haystack Observatory, which is part of MIT, they've, they've already done that. They're, they've got it locked up as he calls it and can't outperform their new 90 to 100 gigahertz, 30 kilowatt radar. I don't know whether that's beam power or, or transmitter <laughs> power, but it's pretty impressive, I thought. But it gets better. The, actual, the next test, test number two that we were asked whether we would like to support, was going to use DSS-14, which is a Canberra 70 meter facility, with a 450 kilowatt X-band transmitter. X-band being somewhere around 10 gigahertz, something like that, I suppose, or eight to 10 gigahertz. Depends on which X-band you're talking about. But anyway, 450 kilowatts um, at that frequency. Amazing, isn't it? Of course, they wanted to use a higher frequency because the target was a lot smaller and they needed a lot more power uh, because the reflected signal would be less. So that's it. Um, as far as I know, it never took place. Perhaps they never did get that new spectrum analyzer. I don't know. But these guys are right at the very forefront of it. Um, the receiver that uh, there's a receiver that they they were developing, which is essentially a um, software defined radio. Uh, and there's a copy of it on board the ISS, apparently. So they're they're playing with these things and trying to get funding to uh, to do interesting stuff. Uh, something that did spring to mind. Ah, oh, never mind. If it comes back to me, I'll I'll cover it. But that that was it. Um, oh yeah. yeah, yeah. Test number two. That they've got to try to convince. Um, headquarters, I suppose, to actually fund them. So this this was the larger email of which I had the extract before about uh, Doppler compensation. 
So, if ever that happens, test number two, I'd. I would certainly like to be in it. Our equipment would be far better up there, and it's a much quieter band on 10 gigahertz. So just drop that back. I'm back to my um, credits there. And, and that pretty much wraps it up, but I'm happy to take questions. As a matter of interest, Chance, the um... That activity is in the May 2015 AR magazine. If anybody has a copy and wishes to read it, it covers pretty much most of what you've been talking about this evening. I don't even, you know, I have no recollection of writing it. Maybe, maybe someone else did. I wrote it. Oh, you it did. Was a, it was a gark submission. Yes. Of, yes. Birth, yes. Okay. Fair enough. So I think we we probably sent you some stuff and you put it together and. And wrote it up for AR. Okay, good. That's right. The, the, the bottom line, right at the end of the article, was uh, I can't remember some some sort of nice expletive about the fact that I'm astonished that Gog has better equipment than NASA. <laughs> well, you know, I'd, I'd, I'd like that to be true, but uh, they've got some pretty flash gear there. Uh, I I really don't know. As I said before, I, I really don't know why they limited themselves with or to just a, a small horn receiving antenna. I'm sure they could have found something better lying around in the in the desert there where they are. Um, and, and mind you, you know the, those those dishes aren't just sitting there waiting for a ham to come along and hook up a, a rig. You know they they're probably in full time service. You know, so I guess perhaps they couldn't spare one from normal operations, I don't know. Uh, they don't really need a, a better spectrum analyzer. If they had the same antenna that we did, their spectrum analyzer would probably have been adequate because they would have had another, you know, 15, 20 dB of signal. Chaz, um, Kelvin here. Um, I'm yeah, just Kelvin. wondering whether uh, I'm right in assuming that their, um, their outfit would have been a bit harder to, to, to run than yours. With um, the horn antenna hard to, hard to point, and um, well, not really. I, no. the, the horn antenna would have had a much wider beam width than our antenna. Yeah, you know? yeah. So they could have just stood outside and held it in their hand, I suppose, and wave it around. <laughs> oh, seriously. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. But what about the, uh, the the bandwidth? Bandwidth. Their um, their uh, one hertz bandwidth. Yeah, oh, that, that, that's the problem. They had to narrow yeah, down the yeah. bandwidth so much. Um, and I don't know how they get down to one hertz bandwidth no. because I think even the spec and we were using only went down to 30 hertz. Mm. So I'm not quite sure whether they extracted the signal via DSP and then referenced mm. it to one hertz bandwidth. You know, that's that may well be what they did. Uh, I don't know the technicalities of how they went about that, but certainly, had they had more signal, it would have been a lot easier for yeah. them to uh, to manage it. Where was their receiving point? I don't know. The dish? Uh, I, I that I don't know. Uh, I should have asked at the time, and uh, obviously, if, if, if they were close and there was some back it, it would, off the it, dish. It, well, it would have, yeah, the, the spillover from the dish would have just swamped their receiver. So yeah, it can't yeah. have been at the same location. No, no. Um, it would, would have, have been, separate, have been separated by Doppler. Wouldn't have mattered. Wouldn't have mattered. It would have no, 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 just so the front end would have got flattened. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I don't know. They're all questions that, you know, probably um, later on occurred to me. And I thought, well, you know, it's sort of all been and gone. So, and I, and I, you don't want to pester these people. You know, they're right. very good about it. Yeah, of course. Um, and, you know, they might have been really happy to answer those questions, as they were for the questions that I did ask. But, you know, I didn't want to just keep no. uh, bothering them. I was say, Is there 20, anyone else? I was going to say, at 20 kilowatts, they would have had to have been a long, long way away. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you would have wanted to have been a long yeah. way away. <laughs> Uh, I'm interested I, with the um, uh, W4DOC, our so-called sister club in the States. I shipped a copy of that across to them. 
uh, the May edition co covering that particular activity. Never did get a response back. I don't know whether they were over impressed or felt they were a little bit lower than we were in terms of our abilities. But, uh, oh, I look, I don't think that there's that there's a great deal of ability required here. I think it was time was the biggest killer. As I say, everything that we needed, we had on hand. It may not have all been flying in formation, but the bits were there. Um, one of the, the trickiest things, actually, was to find how to point the dish. Um, I didn't work out the beam width of the dish, but it's not much. Uh, and, of course, it's 1.2 metres in diameter, so you can't just sort of stand next to it and say, oh, about there. It's not, not mm. enough. Mm. And there's not, nothing to peep through down the middle. Um, so I relied on instinct for azimuth and for elevation. I, it was a, a real, um, um, really cobbled together bit of gear. I'd use a, a you know, school type protractor with a, a bit of uh, copper wire and a, and a lead weight on it that hung down just like a pendulum, just swinging down vertically. And so, and that ran past the protractor. So I could hold the protractor against the edge of the dish, you know, the, the straight edge. And as I elevated the, the, the dish, you know, the protractor showed the angle of the dangle. And, uh, that, and that was accurate enough to get close and then just, manually you know hold the dish fortunately it wasn't windy had it been windy we would have had a lot more trouble so it was a lovely calm day um, and we were able to to do that again you know if i'd had a couple of months of spare in the spare time i would have rigged up something far better and it just wasn't practical and had it been a weekend you know we could have got up there and got set up in plenty of time, uh, uh, such is life. But I'm happy with, with what we got. And, and I should say too that it's, from my point of view, it wasn't, we weren't dealing with a difficult signal to find. I mean, it's 20 kilowatts fired at the moon. In, surely there's going to be enough comeback for us to detect. Um, Hams are doing some, you know, really, really great work on microwave bands on EME. And with EME, you know, with at much lower power levels than that, and much more modest transmit dishes. I was actually in the shack at Charlie and X's one night when he was still here in Lara, and I nearly fell out of my chair. He had a a, a voice contact with a ZL station on 5.7 gigs. Uh, I was just flabbergasted by that. So th this ham's doing some really, really great work. This, this is uh, from a, a a difficulty factor. It was like I've had more difficult contacts with Hayden on <laughs> across Bass Strait. <laughs> uh, so th this was not difficult. Is anyone else? It's just a comment on uh, on YouTube that uh, a local hand put down a gun scope on the dish would have been the go to line up the dish. Yeah, yeah, that's right. In fact, I, I saw the video of the 10 gig mm. contact there, and, and that's exactly right. Yeah. Um, yep, quite right. <laughs> Carlo, a bit like the, the, the Parkes tele radio telescope when they lost the, the feed to the moon. <laughs> They just pointed at that big white thing in the sky. We found yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Instead of all the maths. <laughs> just an, an interesting point that, that I'll make about the the signal power going to the moon. You might think, oh, the bigger the dish, the better. You know, the more gain the dish has got, the more signal is going to come back. But it doesn't quite work that way because the moon itself is a reflector and it exhibits reflected gain. The signal that's that bounces back is uh, undergoes uh, there's a re there's a, a double bunger gain that the moon collects a lot of the signal that 
uh, reaches it, and then it re you get that gain on receive as well. But as you make the dish bigger and bigger, the beam gets smaller and smaller. So you're illuminating less and less of the moon's surface. So you get to the point where it's of, of diminishing returns. When you're illuminating a smaller area, you're getting less reflector gain, but you're concentrating the power into a smaller area itself, but you don't get additional reflector gain off the moon. So um, hmm. the, the extra uh, gain of the dish didn't, wouldn't have helped in that sense, but it did help JPL because they were trying to, they were deliberately trying to, uh, I think, image surface irregularities of the moon. So you need the resolution of a very fine beam width uh, for that purpose. Uh, it's all very impressive, Chas. Um, mm, absolutely. It, um, well, I, I, it just goes to show the the ingenuity that a couple of backyard hams can come up to come up with at short notice and get damn good results. Look, it, it's partly having the, the the stuff available, you know, and we didn't have to actually build any any gear. We just had to assemble stuff that we had built before, you know, that we used for other purposes. We just had to stick it all together and yeah, make it you're work. you able to repurpose what you had on hand. Yeah. yeah. And then there was a, the very fortunate aspect that wherever you find uh, radio equipment, there'll be a ham involved <laughs> who can borrow the oh, yes. equipment. And, One does uh, network. Like yeah, and, and, yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. You just have to have one lying around. So yeah, <laughs> it, hmm. the, that, the that's fortuitous. Sorry. Can I ask a question? You know these uh, rig old uh, spectrum analyzers that you get nowadays. You can yep. probably pick up for a thousand dollars, something reasonable. Would that do the job if you at least had the you know the, your, your LNAs at the front? No, well, no. I've never used one, but uh, I, I, I suspect that it would probably be okay, providing you can get the resolution bandwidth down to yeah. at least maybe 300 hertz, and I reckon they would. Yeah. Um, they're, they're probably fine, yeah. yeah Chaz, well. the, the, the location you chose, if I recall correctly, was Lovely Banks. Yeah. For, for the activity. Why? Why was that one chosen? Because we need to get out of town and up high. We needed to be able to see the, the rising moon. And from a suburban location, you've got the clutter of buildings and trees and all that. You, we wouldn't have seen it until it was too late. That, that was the best best one of the lot, wasn't it? Well, I wouldn't say it was the best spot. Uh, the other thing is we you need to get out. Of, because of the band, two gigs, you know, it's, it's inhabited by an awful lot of noise Ooh. from all sorts of stuff. And we needed to get away from that. I don't think we achieved that too well. But at least we did get up high and had a, a perfect view of the horizon. An LTE site right next to you, Jeff, and that, that was part of the problem. And I suspect that yeah. might also be why JPL had a uh, rethink of the frequencies they used to go. Their received problem was the same as ours. Uh, the original frequency was uh, they, they had local interference in the LTE channel. And yeah, I, look, I, I don't, I don't know about that because I, you know, again, I would think that they would have a fairly quiet radio site for receiving. I don't know that they're, they're all the unknowns. Yeah, but in our case, as it turns out, the frequency they picked was right in the middle of the garden. Yeah, it would have been better if it was on two point four gigs for us, yeah, but hey, you know. In the garden band between the two channels that they use. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> Still, we'll never know. Now, I did ask Brian. Uh, earlier on before this, whether he would like to say or tell us something about his uh, experiment, because Brian uh, was probably the only, probably the only other uh, operator who tried to receive the signal. So are you there, Brian? Is Brian still with us? He got from all probably. Okay, well, if... He's back. He's back. <laughs> Brian, did you want to have uh, or give, give us an insight into your experiments uh, with this? I'll stop my screen share because I don't think it's really necessary now anymore. And I'll, I'll come back to life. Here we go. 
You'll need to unmute yourself. Uh, is that better? That's better. Oh, yes, very good. All right. Um, I was the one that tried to promote uh, people to do this exercise and very, very glad that you got into it. Charles did such a good job. My uh, uh, receiving gear was a, a TV down converter, uh, which I'd had characterised by a friend nearby here. Uh, with the necessary microwave equipment. And uh, we, this was the antenna that goes on the uh, end of the uh, um, end of the um, down converter. And so that was just feeding into the uh, FT100 transceiver, which I had in the car. And whereas you went to a site uh, to get a good uh, view to the east, I was, uh, I'm in Mulgrave and uh, went to the rooftop of the uh, Waverley Garden shopping centre and had a very good takeoff. And the your image of the moon above the horizon looked just looked just like it did at Waverley Gardens, <laughs> but unfortunately had the wrong air frequency and didn't receive a thing. Oh. But uh, can you see that antenna? That's a circularly polarised mm. um, Yagi uh, without the ground plane and the converter that went on the back. I just tried to get it get I've got it nearby, but didn't have time to get that for you to show you. But uh, that's what I was using. I'm sure it would have worked, but uh, had I been on the right frequency. So there you are. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was interested to hear your comments about the uh, uh, um, using the radar to characterise reflecting objects, and uh, I guess that's why the uh, um, the ranging tones that were being used uh, at the PRN range, ranging codes. Um, they that can get that. So with the uh, I think they quoted about two two megabits or something rather, and uh, with with all of that, you end up with a, a ranging actually down to meters. And um, uh, my first uh, uh, um, experience of that was uh, when I was up at Woomera. I was at the um, uh, then the um, then, then operating Island Lagoon tracking station when the, in the early days when they were tracking the orbiter, orbiter satellites going around the moon prior to selecting landing sites. And at that stage, they had the the ranging tones running, and uh, they explained how that was working. That just uses a pseudo random generated code. Uh, I don't know if any of you are familiar with that, but they uh, just modulate your transmitter with that and correlate it with the received signal and uh, adjust the phasing until you get the uh, till it corresponds to the range, and you can incrementally get uh, ranges very accurately. So they're aiming at Tycho and uh, getting um, uh, objects that size being illuminated. Then if they they can get the exact range, and if you imagine that happening on other place, uh, spots on the moon, that's how they would have been able to could have characterised the uh, surface of the moon. So yeah, yeah. That, that little bit. Anyway, I do have to go off to another call, so, but uh, certainly appreciate your uh, uh, presentation tonight, Charles. And thanks for uh, calling in too tonight, Brian. It's nice to uh, catch up with you after five years of the <laughs> that have elapsed since the, uh, the experiment. So finally, we, uh, we do meet. Yeah, good. Thank okay, you. Okay, I'll leave you guys to it. <laughs> Look forward to seeing you in the future. Okay. Yeah. Hayden, was there anyone else who, who might have had a question? Um, there's no, there's just a couple of just comments uh, on YouTube. Um, uh, Peter VK5. Uh, oh dear, my memory's terrible tonight. VK5. Peter Sumner, VK5. Uh, Peter. Yeah. PD? Yeah. P P oh, yeah. Hello, Peter. Him. G'day, Peter. Sorry that we forgot <laughs> your call sign. Uh, he just put, uh, nice to have big NASA budget for power amps. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. That would it be would good. have been nice to see one of those Clystone transmitters, I tell you. Oh, look, I don't even know what it would look like. Five, uh, I've seen, BK5 PJ. PJ. <laughs> yeah. well, Peter, many, when many, worked, when many times. When I was working at Seven, we had a, a two kilowatt Klystron transmitter for the uplink for OSAT when Seven used to do the uplink. Uh, and it's about the size of a small uh, bar fridge. But uh, the power supply for it was about double the size to run the thing. Mm. Um, yeah. Not, they don't look too big, but uh, 20 kil till kilowatt, that'd be pretty massive, I'd say. Yeah, to say nothing of 450 kilowatts. At, at X band, you know, you need a power station just to run your facility. <laughs> yeah, I'd say they'd probably all phase together. The small ones all phase together. Oh, yeah, but in the end, you still got to power them. Mm. Yeah. 
there's no no more comments. Thanks, uh, Chaz, for your presentation. It was really interesting. Yeah, and thanks for your part in this too, Hayden. That's good. I'll um I'll shut the stream down now. But thanks for everyone who's been uh, watching on the uh, on the live stream tonight. Good. Thank you so much. Appreciate it.